Welcome back to another hour of In Deep. I'm Angie Quero, and I am ever so pleased to bring you a news wrap-up before we move to our topic for the hour, and that features a great friend of the program, once upon a time on Live from the Left Coast with us, and now making her fabulous debut on our show, In Deep. And we asked her, hey, do you remember that theme music you used to have? And she said, yeah, I happen to have that theme music, and she's got it right there. And this makes you think she's all elegant and refined and perhaps even noble. But we know her better than that. See? There we go. It is. That is our wonderful demented sidekick, Buttercup. Gotta laugh of the political carnival. Welcome back to the airwaves, my dear. I'm sorry I cannot utter, utter one more word without my super duper ultra President Obama radio prompter. <laughs> we call that a script around here. Oh, well, sorry. it's not on little stands with glass. That's <laughs> it. Mine, mine are right in front of me, right here on my desk. And uh, I think it's important that we use those sometimes. Well, you know, the teleprompter is the meme from the right that will not die. Oh, God, yes. It's, it, they, they go on endlessly about it. They actually make Obama out to be somebody who's less intelligent and less articulate and less wonderfully eloquent than he is. Uh, in fact, they should be talking about John Kasich, who did a State of the State speech without a teleprompter and talked about things like Seinfeld and non-blue tongue cows and, and uh, started imitating somebody with Parkinson's instead. He imitated someone with Parkinson in his State of the State speech. Yes. When what? he talked about deep brain massage, for some reason, he was imitating because he wasn't using notes. He went off the cuff instead of relying on, you know, when you're doing an important speech, every word is parsed. Wouldn't you like every word to be correct? Wouldn't you like every word to be eloquent <laughs> instead of idiotic? Um, and and what, when I tell my theater students, because I've, I've done that in the past, uh, when I tell them, don't put your nose in a, a bunch of notes, look at the audience. That's another thing teleprompters are good for. Ah, well, at least we can't ac accuse him of having used a teleprompter. We can just accuse him of having been an idiot off the cuff. Oh, God, he needs a brain prompter. <laughs> well, more idiocy from the world of the Android, apparently. Yes, oh, yes. Verizon has a new Android app called Iris, which is Siri backwards, the um, iPhone app Siri. And if you ask it, and why would anybody, is abortion wrong? <laughs> because that's the first thing you want to ask your phone, right? What, is this um, the magic eight ball? Ask later. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Science point to yes. Uh, she says, yes, abortion is wrong. The Lord has said you shall not murder. Exodus 2013. The life that is growing within the mother is a child, a baby. The Bible looks at the life in the womb as a child. Thanks. That's what it says. Wow. Does it have a little vomiting sign, the sound to follow up with? Because that's no, about but you what know it what it does have? It has a little thing that says this answer wasn't helpful and you can click on an X. How about this answer is totally, never mind. I can't say that on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, apparently, though, there's another thing making its way through the through the blogosphere and the media that's it's much more illuminating that and it comes from, of all sources, Nancy Pelosi. Yes, Nancy Pelosi has an ad out that is trying to explain the Disclose Act. And she, in the ad, talks about stopping Stephen Colbert. Stop Colbert. He's been using his super PAC to attack my friend Newt Gingrich. He doesn't even like kittens. Colbert must be stopped. And she's doing a good old tongue-in-cheek approach to a very serious issue. And this is being taken seriously by some people? On Facebook, um, they have posted the entire uh, Dis Disclosure Act spiel, if you will. And a commenter said uh, after she saw the video, is this a joke? I am confused. What is the part about Colbert not liking kittens? Of course he loves kittens. Doesn't everybody... This explains so much about the American voting public. Let's give this thing a listen. This is Nancy Pelosi on Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert used to be my friend. I even signed the poor baby's cast when he hurt his hand. But since the day he started his super PAC, taking secret money from special interest, he's been out of control. Even using his super PAC to attack my friend, Newt Gingrich. And if that weren't enough, I hear he doesn't even like kittens. <laughs> Colbert must be stopped. I'm Nancy Pelosi, and I support this ad because Americans deserve a better tomorrow today. Oh, that Join is brilliant. <laughs> I'm so impressed with her that she actually managed to do that. Have you seen this in her character before? This is new to me. I, I've seen her be a little whimsical and, and, and likable, but this is brand new. And I love the fact that you reach people with humor. That I taught a comedy class. You, you're, you create a bond with humor. This will create a bond with a whole lot more people than if she just said, hey, listen, there's this thing called the Disclose Act, and it's important. 
Well, let me tell you, little Missy, I think you've just created a bond with a whole new pack of listeners, and <laughs> I think we'll extend your contract another week. You want to join us again? Oh, thank you. I swear I'll work for the same wages, too. <laughs> Shh, we weren't supposed to talk about that on the air. <laughs> Now she's going to go to the union. Gotta Laugh is Laffy, and she writes for the Political Carnival. And the internet address for that, madame, is? Thepoliticalcarnival.net. Indeed. And she's there with her friend Patty, who takes a little more serious vein on the, on the news between the two of them. You'll get everything you need. The serious stuff, the laughs, and the occasional just plain wackiness. Laffy, thank you so much. We'll see you at the same time next week. Thank you so much. And coming up here on In Deep, we are going to be talking about Alec. Alec is a group you need to know about. You won't like them, but you need to know about them. So stick around and get more of that on In Deep. You can hear more of my conversation with Laffy at indeep.org, our website. Welcome to another hour of In Deep. I'm Angie Cuero. Thanks for joining us for another hour. We're going to learn all about something that you may or may not have heard of. And no matter whether you feel yourself acquainted with this topic, you're going to learn more. Let's start with the basics. It is pretty well established how bills work, right? How, how a bill gets through the legislature. We know this. I'm just a bill. There he is. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Yeah, and then he goes well, up and so long, long legislators talk it over. Capitol and in fact, before he even got there as a little piece of paper on the Capitol well, steps, the legislators are supposed to get inputs from the citizens they represent. They put together laws for public good, then they take them to the legislator as a whole to be voted on. But it didn't work that way last November, where a funny thing happened on the way to the congressional floor in Florida for a bill supposedly written by Republican Representative Rachel Bergen. Now, her bill started like this. This is at the top of the page. Whereas, in the mission of the American Legislative Exchange Council to advance the Jeffersonian principles of free markets, limited government, federalism, and individual liberty... What? Now, what kind of legislation is that? Well, it was, in fact, a proposed law written at least in good part by one of America's most powerful behind-the-scenes puppet masters, ALEC. ALEC, A-L-E-C, stands for American Legislative Exchange Council. And a look at its pedigree will tell you an awful lot about what you need to know. ALEC was founded in 1973 by, among others, Paul Weyrich. Now, Paul Weyrich stood for everything that is wrong about the new right. Homophobic working very hard to write his anti-gay bias into American laws. He was a dominionist who wanted to see the laws of our country conforming to the Old Testament. He was a racist. He worked against anything that he felt smacked even vaguely of what he deemed socialism. And you can imagine how wide his definition of socialism was. He's dead now, to which I make no comment, but by leaving Alec in his wake, he and his colleagues made sure that these standards would be carried forth into new generations. Today's Alec works to bust unions, to assert the power of the market over society, and to keep the 1% safely ensconced away from the 99%. Now, Rachel Burgess's bill was not unusual in its clear authorship by Alec. It's just rare that it was such a public slip to leave their preamble on the proposed bill. She's kind of like the kid who gets the test answers under the desk in high school. Now, most kids would usually pull off the note that says, hey, Rachel, here are all the answers. She turned it in with that note still on. Usually, Alec fiercely protects its private machinations. Its functions are open to a strictly controlled invitation list. And this hour, you're going to learn how far they go to keep the press and the public out of their power exchange gatherings. And some of these stories are going to smack you right in the gut. So let's go to this discussion with Lisa Graves. She writes for the Center for Media and Democracy's PR Watch, and she's part of its special project, Alec Exposed. Lisa, I'm so glad to have you here on Indeep. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Now, Alec is, is a big story, and it has a lot, a lot of tentacles out there. So I gave kind of a rundown of where it came from and what it's about. Can you fill in the blank for us? Who is Alec comprised of today, and what, what's its primary purpose? Well, sure. Alec, uh, not to be confused with Alec Baldwin, I suppose, the more famous Alec for right now. <laughs> um, Alec, the American Legislative Exchange Council, describes itself as the largest 
body of state legislators in the country. That definition actually belies part of the truth about ALEC, which is that in fact, over 98% of the funding for ALEC's operations are from everything but the dues from legislators. They're from corporations, from corporate foundations, and from other sponsorships by corporations. And so here's a group that is made up of, they say, up to 2,000 state legislators from across the country whose um, trips and uh, conventions are being bankrolled by some of the largest global corporations in the world. And so ALEC is a group that has extraordinary influence in terms of the, the bill that was introduced in Florida, where the legislator was either, as some have said, uh, too, too lazy or not attentive or perhaps not smart enough to remove um, the ALEC uh, cut and paste uh, reference from her bill. In terms of that bill, that resolution, it was about cutting corporate taxes. And what we know from our project, which is called ALEC Exposed, and it's at alecexposed.org, what we know is that part of the longstanding agenda of the ALEC corporations that bankroll ALEC is to cut corporate taxes and to basically ensure that the richest corporations in the world are as, as, as least accountable as possible. Well, and, and imagine they would want to hide that agenda from the American people. I, I can't fathom. But <laughs> the, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, is, as you say, presented as a legislative group, but it does have these private people in there. Who, who are the corporations that we know are there, and who are the big political donors that we know are affiliated? ALEC is a group that has uh, a huge number of some of the biggest corporations in the world on its corporate board. Those corporations include uh, Coke Companies, which is the uh, Coke brothers, the billionaire Coke brothers, um, David and Charles Coke. Mm -hmm. uh, it includes um, Exxon. Uh, it includes the big uh, pharmaceutical companies. It includes Pfizer. It includes the big tobacco companies like Reynolds. Uh, it includes Walmart. Uh, it includes State Farm Insurance and Kraft Foods. So it's it's got some of the biggest corporations in America, some of the biggest corporations in the world that are sitting on the board of ALEC. And th many of those corporations also sit on these task forces. And on an ALEC task force, corporations, through their lobbyists or their representatives, vote as equals with state legislators on so-called model legislation to change our rights. And so what you have is a group of corporations sitting behind closed doors alongside ALEC politicians with an equal vote on model bills. And then these so-called model bills that are approved by the corporations and politicians are then ratified by the ALEC um, politicians on the ALEC board. You know, there's um, something refreshingly honest about this because normally there's a lot of denial that the people <laughs> who hold the money have the same vote or more than the politicians. At least they're straightforward about that. <laughs> the money gets to vote, period. Uh, that is one way to look at it. You know, another way to look <laughs> at it would be that... Um, here you have your legislator who's supposed to be representing you going off to some uh, resort in another city, in another state, and actually having the gumption to sit behind closed doors where you can't see what he or she is doing, uh, to sit there and amend legislative language with corporations to actually dare to deign, basically, to give a corporation that wasn't elected to do anything an equal vote to himself or herself on that bill is just astonishing to me. And then some of these same politicians have the audacity to come back to your state house and introduce this very bill that they already pre-voted on, that they basically took a, peak, a pinky square to support, um, and then to basically walk into that legislature, introduce that bill cleansed of any reference to the fact that it was already pre-voted on by a corporation. It almost sounds like a weird Hollywood conspiracy movie. And what was really, you know, gripping is that it's true. It's happening. In fact, even by their own account, and, and this is uh, information that came from Alec itself, they have at least 20% of their proposed bills that they put together every year actually make it into real law. I mean, there's, there's no pretense here that they don't have a huge amount every year They've got approximately 800 bills that, at least in part, come out of ALEC model legislation, and 20% of those become law across the country. Now, one of the things you brought up 
is is the sheer number of legislators that show up there. Alex's word is that they have more than 2,000 state legislators there um, and government representatives as well. Who are these legislators? Are we talking the Green Party here showing up? <laughs> no, uh, we're not talking about the Green Party. Um, Alec is, uh, describes itself as a, a nonpartisan organization, a bipartisan organization. Um, in fact, um, in some states across the country, Alec legislators have gotten the rules changed so that every single member of the state legislature is automatically a dues-paying member of Alec. Legislative dues are about 50 bucks a year, $100 for two years. Some politicians are so cheap they have the taxpayer foot the bill. And meanwhile, the corporations are paying, you know, $2,000, $5,000, $10,000, $100,000 dollars to support ALEC every year. Um, what we know is that ALEC um, does have some Democratic members. It has had some, and some of those are members who are not members of their own choosing because their state legislature has basically made them a member against their will. If you look at the ALEC leadership, however, when we surveyed this um, last August, it turned out that out of over 100 legislative leaders in ALEC, meaning they were um, co-chairs of any of the states in the country for ALEC, or they were co-chair of one of these ALEC task forces, it was 99% Republican and predominantly right-wing Republican. Yowch. Well, at, at least we know then what their goals are, is if we look at the Republican Party as it stands, we can pretty much see cheek by jowl, these are the goals of ALEC, these are the goals of the, of the strength of the Republican Party? Well, you know, it's interesting because on the one hand, you have uh, some of the planks, the, the party planks, but what ALEC does is operationalize sort of this corporate vision of how the world should be. And so while you might have a, a philosophical position in favor of, you know, theoretically free markets, let's just say that use the word free markets, whatever that might mean. Um, what ALEC does is it provides these politicians a way to make that legally binding on the rest of us by privatizing public education, by privatizing prisons. And, uh, and when I say privatization, I'm not talking this sort of term people have heard about public-private partnerships and that whole rhetoric. I'm talking about taking your tax dollars that would go into a public institution and taking those tax dollars out of the public institution and putting them in the private sector where the services are provided, uh, for instance, by teachers who are less qualified, less experienced, so that a school corporation can take profit off the top. Same with prisons. Take the money out of the prison system, put it into a private prison corporation so that they can provide prison services with less experienced guards in, in many instances who have fewer rights. Um, and then take a huge portion of your tax dollars and convert it into profit. And not just profit this year, but profit every year, endlessly, an endless stream of profit based on your tax dollars. And most insidiously to me in recent years, over the last several years, in fact, um, Alec has been pushing an agenda to privatize public institutions, meaning the buildings that you as a taxpayer own, the buildings that are the government buildings that are the result of your tax dollars, the assets owned by the state, by the people, ALEC reps have actually said that those buildings ought to be sold off to the private sector and that the government, your government, we the people, ought to become tenants of the corporations, of the buildings that our tax dollars originally paid for. Lisa Graves is executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy. She publishes PR Watch, Source Watch, Bankster USA, and particularly relevant to this conversation, alecexposed.org. That's A-L-E-C, exposed.org. She'll be with us in the next segment as well, so stick around for more of In Deep. I'm Angie Coiro. Welcome back to In Deep. I'm talking to Lisa Graves about ALEC, and she knows all about it. In addition to being the executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy, she has been spearheading ALECExposed.org, and that is one of PR Watch's uh, pet causes, really exposing what happens with this group, how much influence they have on both legislators and legislatures. So let's get back to that. Lisa, you had said that the, the issue of ALEC moving into the public sector, taking over public buildings, taking over, you know, privatizing public functions, and the profit goes to these corporations that are involved. It's a little bit important to know how we define profit. I mean, we're talking about after net costs. I mean, the bottom line is, is this, ta is the public 
funding all of these functions, and then all the profit goes off to the corporations. Well, it's it's if, if you just look at the situation with the privatization of prisons, uh, you know, t- over 20 years ago in the mid 1980s, there weren't even there was not such a thing as a private prison. The private prison industry has emerged uh, basically at, at the same time as Alec has grown in power, and Alec corporations and Alec politicians were pushing this prison privatization agenda. That prison industry now is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's built on your tax dollars. And then, for instance, in Arizona, there are some places in which um, CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, which was previously the chair of the ALEC Public Safety Task Force, and which was a long-standing member of ALEC until about a year or so ago when a lot of uh, light was shown on their past role. Um, CCA, in some counties, is the biggest employer in that county. And then they, then they say that they should have more say over your policies because they're such a big employer. But <sighs> in reality, that prison, if it were a public institution, would be your, your prison, in essence. It would be owned by the taxpayers, and you wouldn't be lobbied by that prison uh, for more policies adva- advantaging that prison. So tax dollars, your tax dollars are going into those private prisons. Um, a portion of that, of that tax money is um, obviously going to provide for the prisoners and for the buildings, but a portion of that tax money is going to profits for the prison warden the, 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 and a profit-sharing sort of plan for the CCA prison wardens, as well as to the CCA corporation. Um, and then that corporation, CCA, is also then using some of your tax dollars that are the profit portion of this, in essence, or quasi-profit, to then lobby your legislators for more prison privatization. Youch. It's, it's, it's an endless circle, the snake eating its tail. It is. And then on top of that, what we've seen is in some places an effort to use the prison population as part of the count for the population of a county um, for purposes of services and voting. And so you have people being housed in prisons who can't vote but are being counted toward the size of that county or that city in which takes money away from cities and puts that money into rural districts because they have a gigantic prison in it. Let's talk a little bit about the efforts to bring what Alec has been up to all these years to the public's attention. And of course, you know, we have PR Watch doing the very good work that you folks are doing. But there have been a number of journalists over the years that have tried to get into either the hotels where some of these gatherings are being held or, you know, heavens forfend, the actual events themselves. Tell us some of those tales, because I think it's important for people to know what happens when people try to shed some light here. Well, in August, after we unveiled Alec Exposed and we exposed um, and made uh, made available to the public these these uh, so-called model bills um, that basically would rewrite your rights, uh, we um, our our staff went to New Orleans and asked for credentials uh, to attend um, the Alec convention. And our staffer um, Eric uh, Carlson was denied credentials. He left the credential table. Uh, at the Marriott Hotel and went to the lobby to file his story about how he was denied credentials and hotel security, in essence at Alec's behest, asked him to leave, that he couldn't even be in the in the lobby of the of the building. Similarly, the Center for American Progress had two reporters there and they requested that they um they requested that they be uh credentialed. Uh, one of them was not credentialed and it, in the process of of saying that asking that he be credentialed in essence he was sort of scuffed up and they were pushed out of the building mm. um and also in new orleans al jazeera america which is a uh you know an international uh, news station that has a an american broadcast audience as well al jazeera america the american part of that station asked for credentials and they were told that uh by the press office of alec that um that they wouldn't get credentials because they were foreign press and the, <laughs> and the and the issue was domestic. However, at that very conference, at that very day, um, there were foreign politicians present and including uh, foreign politicians speaking at the ALEC conference about the Keystone Pipeline. And, um, and many of the corporations that were there are foreign and international corporations. In fact, the headline corporation for the ALEC conference in New Orleans a year after the BP disaster was BP, British Petroleum. Uh, you know, I almost don't want to finish this interview. I'm g- I, w- I was going to eat some lunch after this, and I'm starting to think that you're killing my appetite for the rest oh, of my I'm life. Oh, I'm sorry. 
what? No, this is a, this is the kind of appalling thing that unfortunately people have to know. And what you're establishing here is those who would go in to represent the public are are being turned away. In some cases, right up against the edge of what one would consider to be the law. Someone who is registered at a hotel being allowed to stay at that hotel when he is registered as a reporter, when he is registered as a member of of a reporting organization, and then being told that he's been staying there under false pretenses and Alec wants him to leave. To your knowledge, have any legal, has has there been any legal blowback for Alec and for the people they represent and the power they're exerting? I mean, it sounds to me like some civil rights are getting a little bit smushed here. Well, and uh, just and just to clarify on that point, um, the the reporter um, in Arizona is a reporter named Bo Hodai who was um, working, who's worked for In These Times magazine, a, a magazine that's been around for decades. Um, he um, had sought credentials; they had not given him credentials, but he was staying in the hotel of Alec, and he was um, actually <clears throat> at the point before he was removed from the hotel, he had been having um, drinks. Uh, in the public bar, in the publicly accessible bar of the hotel with a reporter from the Toronto Star who had been credentialed, who was credentialed. And um, at the, as, at the, as they finished speaking and having drinks um, and, and got up to leave, our, um, armed uniformed police officers um, at the direction of the hotel um, executive basically uh, escorted him to his room to be kicked out of the hotel. And meanwhile, other armed police officers um, uh, inquisitioned the Toronto Star's reporter about what she was doing talking to him. Um, and uh, ultimately, Bo was uh, kicked out of the hotel. They claimed that he was there under false pretenses. Um, and uh, I think that that was a really bogus charge, quite frankly. Then when I went to pick him up at the curb, they wouldn't let me pick him up at the lobby. They escorted him to the curb of the, of the hotel by the um, street um, I went to pick him up and I saw that he was surrounded by these three ar- armed and uniformed police officers. So I took out my phone to take a picture of it. And uh, in essence, the, the cops were threatening uh, that, that this would be criminal trespass. Um, and, uh, and I stepped back off the curb and they said, this is still private property. Um, and then they started filming me attempting to take a picture of them, uh, basically escorting a, a, a reporter um, off the grounds. Wow. That's, it, it, do you, as an organization or as individuals, in, intend to file any action here? Um, well, I think that I think that the people in Arizona who heard about this were quite astonished that a um, that a hotel would have um, uh, city police officers um, doing basically doing off duty police work on behalf of on behalf of the hotel on behalf of uh, basically doing carrying out what Alec wished. Alex said that they didn't, in essence, desire that Bo be there. And I think that some of the people who've heard that have have said that this seems like a civil rights violation. I don't know, you know, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, but I, I do know that it, for me, as an American citizen, um, as, a, as a person who loves this country and loves the First Amendment, I'm sort of shocked and appalled that an organization that is made up of state legislators would have such disregard for the freedom of the press um, that they would behave with such tactics as they did in New Orleans and as they did um, in Arizona toward the press. Um, and I, I think that I think that it's not behavior becoming, uh, it's not behavior becoming, in essence, so to speak. It's not becoming of a gentleman. It's not becoming. Uh, it's not behavior becoming of a, a body of legislators. Um, they should be setting the highest standards for uh, the treatment of the press. Uh, they should be abiding by the, um, by the best practices of an open society, of open government, and they shouldn't be hiding what they're doing from the American people when these are our legislators, they're our elected officials, and they're hanging out behind closed doors with these corporations and these corporate lobbyists, and we have a right to know. Lisa, I want to thank you so much for all of this this fantastic information, and I'm going to encourage our listeners to to hang on and, and listen to more of our guests as they come on, but they'll be able to hear more of me and you online together. So thank you for your extra time. Uh, my pleasure. Lisa Graves is Executive Director of the Center for Media and Democracy and the moving force behind AlecExposed.org. Now, Alec Exposed actually worked with The Nation, The Nation magazine at thenation.com, 
to put together a whole expose on Alec, and they went into details on the public schools, on the other venues that they work on. That public schools article in particular was written by Julie Underwood, and she's going to join us now to talk about what Alec's targets are in the educational field and how we might stop them. Julie Underwood is a nationally recognized authority on school law and dean of the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Education as of August 2005. Julie Underwood, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for talking about this important issue. We hear a scatterings, little bits of things that we ultimately find out are gathered underneath the ALEC umbrella. Some people are familiar with the voucher fight. Some people are familiar with charter schools and privatized schools. And it all comes up under this idea of bringing corporations further and further into the schools. Do you think the public as a whole, the parents who are working to put their children into schools, do you think this is widely understood? Well, I think that that's one of the important things that conversation like this can bring to light. ALEC is not generally understood at all. I think ALEC is probably um, not understood even by some some lobbyists across the uh, the United States. So it's important to actually think about this and, and to realize who's pulling these strings. And the strings that are being pulled are in the name of bringing more money into the coffers of the large corporations. Are there other goals at hand or is that the, the primary oh, right there? Oh, no, definitely. Within, within education, I mean, the motivation isn't just corporate greed. I mean, the motivation is actually to privatize education um, and to introduce market factors into the teaching profession, particularly allowing for alternative certification and private certification programs. The, the shocking one is really to reduce the influence or really eliminate local school districts and local school boards. So in this situation, it's not just it's not just corporate profits. It's really ideological. And the ideology that they're working to displace is what? Well, um, you know, even in a in a, a 1985 as long ago as that in a 1985 piece, um, they talked about about public education, you know, was really having problems because it was supposed to serve the needs of all children. And that they found to be a problem. Ah, well, um, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's really bad when, I mean, public education is supposed to serve the needs of all, all children. Um, but the ideology here is, is really to allow people to, um, to take the public money and make private choices with them. And so um, to create schools which can be de- which can be segregated in terms of religion, um, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of ability, um, or just p- parental choice. As we explained to our listeners in the first part of the show, we talked about how Alec puts bills together, blends them almost like a dating service for legislators, blends the bills with the legislators, and lo and behold, 20% of the bills that come out of ALEC become law across the country. Can you give us an example of ALEC legislation that has now become law affecting the schools? Well, there, there are a lot of them. Actually, when you, uh, when you look at a lot of the, uh, the voucher programs that are introduced across the United States, most of those are ALEC-based. Um, a lot of the, uh, the charter legislation is ALEC-based. Um, the virtual school legislation is ALEC, is, a lot of that is ALEC-based. Um, and ex- I'll give you an example. In Tennessee, um, there are a couple of legislators who are ALEC members introduced a bill uh, for the, the Virtual Public Schools Act, mm-hmm. virtually unchanged. Um, and then, then the, uh, the lobbyists from some of the corporate members of ALEC uh, worked to get this passed in, in Tennessee. Once it was virtually unchanged, I mean, at least at least it wasn't left with the insert name of state here <laughs> but but it really is the uh, the virtual the virtual education bill and then um lo and behold that was passed and the companies that that lobbied for it received no bid contracts from a number of school districts uh to to create this a virtual academy in the state of Tennessee hmm. that's the way it works and speaking of academies, they've just held their, their educational academy on Amelia Island in Florida, and they've also released their ALEC report card. I've only alluded to that so far, so why don't you explain to us this report card, what it incorporates and what it's for? Well, 
Um, ALEC has, has sent out materials to its members about education fairly consistently across, uh, you know, for the last, well, since since 1985, when I found, at least that's the, the oldest one that I found. The most recent ALEC report card is their 17th edition. That's how long they've been at this. And it really um, looks at every single state and it grades them uh, based on how well they've been able to implement the ALEC privatization agenda. That gives so me re- chills. That actually gives me chills. Well, here's one that might give you chills even more, um, because a few years ago they they uh, published a, a document which was a roadmap for ALEC in education, um, went state by state, um, gave gave ALEC members suggestions on pieces that they could implement within their state uh, to privatize their public schools. Let me stop you there. How do people know whether they see a bill? How do they know this is the product of ALEC? Well, they can look at ALEC Exposed. Uh Aha, of course. They can look at ALEC Exposed and see if those are pieces, or they can ask the people who who, um, introduced these pieces of legislation if they are members of ALEC and if this is an ALEC written bill. What about the union's trying to stand up to ALEC as, as part of that. Um, th- there are the group that is definitely in ALEC's sites, uh, the teachers' unions and other unions as well. Give us a little background on that and how they're fighting back. That's a, a kind of a state-by-state fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and really it's looking at uh, candidates who are not ALEC-controlled and becoming much more focused as unions together to stand up to ALEC and in this way to provide some kind of foil so that we aren't just run over by the ALEC proposed legislation. I wish we had more time to spend together, but you've given us a marvelous overview, and I really want to thank you for spending your time with us. Thanks so much for talking about this issue. Julie Underwood is Dean of the School of Education and a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She was, before that, general counsel of the National School Boards Association. You can find her article in The Nation. We'll put that link up on our website, indeep.org. Our conversation about Alec continues. Alec isn't always in the dark. Sometimes he comes out into light. And we have someone in our next segment who actually went and looked at him. I'm Angie Corr. This is Indeep. Welcome back to In Deep. I'm Angie Cuero. We are spending this hour with our new best friend, Alec. Au contraire, actually. Alec is the best friend of the 1%, not you and me. Matchmaker between legislators and lobbyists. The playwright for the scripts that are acted out on congressional floors and in law books across the country. We established with our earlier conversation this hour what Alec is, who is behind it, and particularly the effect they're having on educational policies and legislation. If you missed any of that, you can find this whole show archived at indeep.org, along with our other shows. While you're online, please check out the contribution to our blog this week from Spaco's Brain. He is listing specific action items against Alec for those of you who are energized by this conversation, and I certainly hope that is all of you. So let's talk now to Susan Smith, president of the Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida. Susan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. So Alec held a weekend education conference on Amelia Island in Florida. State legislators weren't all there because they were in session, Susan, but the following Monday, Alec brought the gospel to them, right? So uh, what happened, I think, this is my own speculation, is that they met with the legislators in Tallahassee on Monday to give them a report. Uh, There were, however, only four people in attendance to the meeting I went to, four legislators. There were about a dozen people. And that would mean they can't control who was there. That would be something where, you know, that would have to be open to the public? Well, you know, Florida prides itself on its sunshine laws, but our legislators have managed to exempt themselves from a lot of the sunshine. So we we call ALEC uh, democracy killer because we think that they're trying to make government in the dark so that the people don't know what's going on. So they have these meetings that are by invitation only. They're closed to the press. And the only way to get in is for somebody to let you see an invitation and you kind of make your way into the meeting. Now, when I heard about this meeting the other day, I was at a Democratic Women's Club um, lobbying session in Tallahassee. 
and I got word that there was going to be a meeting with the GOP legislators and the legislative director from ALEC. Uh, I heard the meeting was on Tuesday, but then I heard that it was going on uh, as I was sitting in another hearing. So I was frantically trying to text people to see if anybody knew where the meeting was being held. And I found out, so by the time I got into the meeting, it was about half over. There were perhaps a dozen people in the meeting. There were four Florida legislators there. There was uh, Rachel Bergen, who uh, is just made national news. She was on Keith Olbermann the other night as the, what, worst person in the world yeah. because <laughs> she introduced a piece of ALEC legislation and did not take the ALEC header off the legislation. So they managed to pull it and reintroduce it the next day, I think, with a different bill number on it. She was there. She was the only woman there until I got there. Uh, Representative Frisch, who I think is the majority whip uh, on the House side, Mm -hmm. Uh, a legislator named John Tobiah. I've got a good story about him. And Jimmy Patronus. And Patronus is the one who actually sent out the email invitation that I later saw to this meeting. He did apologize that more people weren't there. Mondays are typically a travel day for the legislature if they go back to the district over the weekend. Mm. There were a couple of people who I think were videotaping, um, and there was a man from the um, the James Madison Institute, which is like a Florida-level ALEC. His name was William Maddox. And then there was Matt Laudner, who is uh, the man who wrote the report card that Alec did for right. the different states. He was in the meeting. He also works for Jeb Bush at his Foundation for Excellence. And then there was a man who is the Alec legislative person. His name is David Mislinski. And there was a union person in there from the Florida Education Association. That must have thrilled uh, them. <laughs> well, uh, yes, and I, they were not happy. And this is where the Tobias, one of the ways he comes into this, at the end of the meeting, we also had another friendly person in the room. And he stayed after every, most people had left, and he overheard uh, Representative Tobias say to Representative Frisch, there were UEs in the room. Ueys, U- he called it, and he said, we've got to run a tighter ship. God, That's, that uh, is and he, so appalling. I know, and at one point, uh, Jeff Wright, who was the Florida Education Association uh, representative who was in the session, was trying to bring out some very important points about education in general that these people needed to hear, and they seemed open to it, but He said, every time you introduce a piece of legislation like this, our numbers, our membership numbers increase, our union membership. And that was another comment that Tobiah made to Representative Frisch, uh, apparently. I didn't hear this. I heard it secondhand, that he said, you know, we've got to be careful about these unions and their growing numbers. It's nice to know we're scaring them a little bit. Isn't that nice to be intimidating them? It is, and and one of the one of our goals as the Progressive Caucus and other progressive groups I'm in is to make people aware of Alec, because so many uh, rank and file activists don't even know about Alec. Well, in fact, so I want to ask you about that because uh, I had mentioned at the beginning of the show, and, and you mentioned yourself what happened with Florida Rep. Uh, Rachel Bergen, and it's quite a thing for someone to introduce a piece of legislation that was clearly authored by a different party, not from the legislator, not from someone in their office, but by an outside group of influence. And my question is, how did that go over locally, specifically with people who may not be politicized, who may not re- really recognize the puppeteers behind the power? I mean, did, do you think this opened any eyes? I don't think it has, actually. This story was broken last fall, and it really didn't get picked up by anybody. And I'm somebody who's pretty engaged in the news, and I missed it. I didn't even uh, hear this story until somebody tweeted it last week. And then uh, several of us retweeted it, and maybe because the ALEC meeting was held in the state, it just got a little more resonant. So... It got picked up nationally by a few people, but this happened in October or November. So it didn't, uh, you know, 
turn any heads in the fall when it happened, and it's turned very few heads this time around. And I think because so many people aren't aware of what ALEC is, Mm -hmm. even if they read it, they might not be aware of the importance of it. Well, you mentioned that there's a Florida version of ALEC, and that that gives me the vision of all these mini ALECs across the country. To your knowledge, is the Florida ALEC uh, an oddity, or are there many ALECs all over the place? I would say they are all over the place. That When you go online and start researching these uh, organizations and institutions, you can see connections all over the place. The one in Florida is called the James Madison Institute. And if you start looking at board members and then you, you, know, you look from board member to board member and different organizations they're a part of, you start to see all the different connections at all the different levels. Mm. Uh, so it's very incestuous, if that's the right word, what's going on. And, you know, the puppet master behind the puppet masters in a lot of these cases is none other than Jeb Bush. Isn't that interesting? That because he know. certainly he has a public profile right now of sitting out the presidential election, maybe not necessarily being terribly involved in things. He's very involved in things. He's very involved. He held a summit uh, out in California last fall, and it was Jeb Bush's Foundation for Excellence, and it was in in San Francisco, and none of the Florida media covered it. There was nobody there. It was almost held in the dark, even though it was public. It was on the website. Three of our state legislators sat on panels because they want to tell everybody how wonderful Florida is. Well, Florida is not wonderful. We've got some major issues because we've been uh, trying Jeb Bush's ideas out for a long time here. And although we do have some excellent schools, thanks to the teachers and the administrators who are you know, doing a yeoman's job every day, uh, these legislators that went out there, one of them, Senator Gates, sat on a panel, call, and the name of it was Don't Let a Financial Crisis Go to Waste. Mm. Uh, Baco got into the room, I think, and did some research. Joel Klein was there. Rupert Murdoch was there. Uh, Melinda Gates, I think, gave one of the keynote addresses. Uh, it was a who's who of uh, the Billionaire Boys Club that's trying to take over public education through ALEC and through the Republican Governors Association and through the Chiefs of Change, uh, Education Commissioners. So this is really a a concerted, organized effort to defund our public school system and divert our tax dollars to private corporations. I'm talking to Susan Smith, uh, president of the Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida. Uh, Susan, you've made a couple references to, to Democrats and Republicans how singular is the idea of a Democrat who's cooperating with ALEC? Is it pretty much strictly a Republican organization, or is there a mix there? I, I'm just throwing this out there based on lists I've just briefly looked at. Maybe if you've got a list of 30 Republicans, you might have two Democrats on the list. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are Democrats, unfortunately, who allow themselves to be um, Oh, hoodwinked? Is that a good, that, is that a nice <laughs> word to use? It's nicer than I would be. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am a part of the party, so I have to be careful here. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's out of ignorance or if it's out of just uh, self-interest. I'm not sure what would possess somebody to fall for this fake reform that we're going through. You know, if these things actually worked, People like me might be open to the ideas that Alec proposes, but there is no evidence whatsoever that any of these ideas are successful with children. Well, it, it's funny that, that you bring up the when you're talking about what works and what doesn't. There is a certain there's a certain acceptance on faith that by what I see the Republicans that these do work or if that's a disingenuous presentation on their part it is in fact that they do see a profit in it which is more of a Republican ideal but I think that what you're expressing about Democrats and you're not clear on why they would affiliate themselves with this I think it's illustrative of the break that we see in the Democrats Republicans have a very strong predictable identity for the most part they are more in lockstep while Democrats don't seem to agree on where the center is. They don't seem to agree on where left is. They don't seem to agree on where the interests of the country lie. And I understand I'm talking to 
the president of the Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida. But I see this reflected in, in issues across the country. I think it's absolutely true, and I think that uh, a big part of this is what happened to the Democratic Party back during the 90s when they bought into this, if we run everything like a business, it's going to be successful, and some things just can't be run like a business, and I think one of those things is, is the school system. Sure, you can have business practices in your financial workings, but when it comes to children and policies and programs that work with children, I think you have to have a whole different model and not a business model. And I think a lot of Democrats haven't gotten to that point yet. I think we are seeing a deliberate resegregation of our school system, and I think that a lot of minority legislators buy into it. I'm not saying they're ALEC members, but they buy into the vouchers and the charters because they do have failing schools in their districts, and they're willing to try anything, and they're taken advantage of by these for-profit charter management companies that come in and sell them a bill of goods about what they can do. Can we go back to um, so what you... I don't know if that helps you see any more about what, what I think is going on. It does. It does help to clarify that. And it, I'm glad to have any understanding of why the Democrats don't seem to cohere around, you know, a, a single purpose. Talk to me about the... You mentioned earlier the Sunshine Laws. And, of course, Florida has them. We have them elsewhere. Is ALEC attackable on any level under the Sunshine Laws? To your knowledge, has anyone ever gone after them, or is there some effort to put together an argument that there's too much happening legislatively outside the public eye? Well, it varies from state to state what those laws are. It seems to be in our state that the law is so specific in order for a meeting to fall under sunshine, you have to have so many legislators present. You have to be discussing pending legislation and maybe even taking a vote on that legislation before the meeting actually comes under sunshine laws. Uh, our ethics laws have no teeth in them, so I know that one of our representatives, the, one of the good guys, Scott Randolph from uh, the Orlando area, uh, wrote a letter to the speaker last August after the big ALEC meeting in New Orleans and ask for a ruling on the, um, is it okay for legislators to take money for these junkets? Because mm -hmm. the one that was held in Florida last weekend was at the Ritz-Carlton, and ALEC offered to pay for the hotel stay. They offered to pay up to $500 in travel expenses and maybe even a food stipend. I can't remember what the, what the exact details were. But this would probably violate, if not violate the gift band, it violates the spirit of all these laws that we have because people think their government is being done in the sunshine, and they think that their legislators are in Tallahassee to represent them. And if they're not aware of what Alec's doing, then we're not really living in a democracy. Do you have any inclination, any idea what a revisiting of Citizens United would mean for ALEC? Would it have any effect at all, or is this well outside the idea of corporations being people, corporations being allowed to contribute much as, as you know, real humans do? Is there any crossover between the issues behind Citizen United and what ALEC is up to? Well, to me there is, because I've worked a lot. Uh, on campaigns, and I know that one of the reasons we can't get good people to run for office in a lot of cases is because of what they're up against when it comes to running for office. For a state house seat in Florida, a state house seat pays $32,000 per year, I think is what they make, and to run a campaign like that, we tell Democratic candidates they need two to three hundred thousand dollars to run the typical House race. Um, you have a competitive race, and it can be up, you know, a half a million dollars to run that race. Well, to raise that kind of money, you have to have corporate support, mm -hmm. or you have to have special interest support, and we just don't have that kind of money coming in to get good people to run. So I think Citizens United could be a help. I think public financing of campaigns would be the best thing we could do because then we might have a level playing field, which is you know, what we need in a lot of different areas of our lives right now. Um, our 
children need a level playing field. Our, you know, the middle class and the working classes in this country need a level playing field, and we can't seem to get that anywhere. Gee, I hate to cut you off on that cheerful note, Susan, but that brings us to the end of our time. <laughs> I know. I'm so full of good news. <laughs> now, it's actually, it's been very informative and a real pleasure to talk to you, and I appreciate it. Well, it's been great to be here. Thanks for having me. Susan Smith is president of the Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida. Thanks for listening this week. Our executive producer is Gordon Whiting. Matt Fiddler is our engineer. Our theme is by Big Troubles. David Gans provides our closing music. Thanks to Peter James Callahan at We Act Radio in Washington and to Hal Ginsburg at KRXA in Monterey, California. We're back next week to once again go in deep. I'm Angie Coiro. Thanks for tuning in this week to In Deep, which is a production of Live from the Left Coast. You can get more information on the show and our company at LFTLC.com. Live from the Left Coast. While you're there, you can become a member and support our work. We have a separate website for the show. That is InDeep.org. If you have any questions or feedback, there's a contact button right there, InDeep.org. We are developing a recurring series on mental health issues in our country, especially in this economy. And you're a big part of that. We'd like your topic suggestions, your stories, and your questions. Send them in via our website, the contact button at indeep.org. Join us again this time next week for two more hours of in-depth conversation. I'm Angie Cuero. Thanks, and we will see you then. You're listening to WPWC, 1480 AM, Dumfries, Virginia. We Act Radio, home of Washington's progressive working community.